Good morning. Hope you're doing well. It is a little bit early, it's 7 30, it's not quite 8 o'clock. Are you guys fully awake? I am. I've already celebrated Mass, had breakfast. I'm ready to go. Really? You had breakfast already? Man, that's a. Uh, you're an early bird, huh? This morning, anyhow. That's awesome. And um, you? Have you had breakfast yet? Have you, uh, you're still on your first cup of coffee? I am. First cup of coffee. I'm not a breakfast person right away after I wake up. I didn't wake up right like now, but uh, I woke up more like 5.30, my alarm went on. Uh, your sound is up. You want to turn down? Uh, so, yeah, I woke up about 5.30, but I can't have breakfast right away. There's something about just waking up that I, it's too much work to eat. <laughs> What do you eat breakfast, Father Bill? Well, I'm not a big breakfast kind of guy where you sit down and have a have a big farmer breakfast. So I usually um, have just a touch of something. I usually I'm up about five and have just a little touch of something, and then and then and then graze a little bit in the morning rather than sitting down to a full breakfast. I'm happier that way. Wow. That's awesome. So you must have to wake up super early to. We come, have breakfast, get ready for mass. Uh, it's a routine. I can make it happen. Right. I think some of it is the farming background. We had a big breakfast. Uh, it's not that I had a big breakfast. I eat oatmeal usually now during the winter. But I uh, find that having some good energy in me is good at the beginning of the day. That's awesome. Along with the Word of God, the other energy. Hey, speaking of the Word of God, right? Yesterday... You caught the transition. <laughs> yeah, yesterday... Uh... I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know about you guys or the people, but I thought it was uh, the conversation we had. It's not necessarily teaching. It was more the conversation of, of uh, dwelling, chewing on the Word of God that gives you life, gives you energy. And this idea of like how do we encounter our risen Lord in the midst of, of this Easter season, in the midst of everything that is going on. Is it even possible to encounter the risen Lord? And as we ended the the... The show yesterday, uh, we ended it with that question. Is it even possible to encounter the Lord? And today we want to kind of break open that gospel of, of the day. Beautiful uh, gospel, the road to Emmaus, right? Everyone kind of knows that gospel by its power, by its meaning. And so we we're going to try to unpack that to see how it is possible to encounter the risen Lord for you and for me now. Right? In the midst of our quarantine and our stay-at-home mandate, that we can encounter, and indeed, our Lord desires that we encounter Him. Any thoughts? Uh, first, I like the photo we got in the background here. It's the picture of the road to Emmaus, certainly how they encountered the Lord. And similarly, the challenge, how do we encounter the Lord? I think it's very important before we jump into the the, the text of the of the. The gospel that we imagine the setting because the setting wasn't just uh, unique to that particular time be aware that when you look at that photo if Jerusalem is from our perspective if we're in Jerusalem and we're looking down the road toward Emmaus which way are they going they're going away they're going away from Jerusalem and Jerusalem not just as the practical city of Jerusalem but Jerusalem as the, the center or the heart of, of faith. And you can make a case that in their dejection, in their disappointment, in their um, maybe even fading faith, they're walking away from Jerusalem. And how many times do we either have knowledge of that either either in our own lives or among friends and family members and those that we have met that essentially have walked away from Jerusalem have walked away from the center of faith have walked away in dejection or disappointment or whatever excuse is made walking away from Christ and and here our Lord then is is catching up to them as they're walking away. And I think as we, if we realize that that is the, the, the mood, the attitude, it helps us then to see 
the beauty and the brilliance of this particular um, uh, gospel scene and story. Absolutely, because uh, the gospel for today, uh, it's Luke chapter 24, 13 to 35, right? This whole story of, of the, the road to Emmaus. And it, 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 it even opens up by saying that it was a, the, it was the very, that very day, the first day of the week, right? It was, it was a Sunday. It was the day of the resurrection. It was still that very day when the disciples were kind of like disappointed, sort of, that uh, the, the Jesus, they knew the Nazarene, they knew that it was going to come and redeem them, faded. And in their eyes, there's almost like a sense of failure. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Because they, the one, so we'll, we'll go through it, right? Uh, so they're walking away with Sunday. They're walking away from, from Jerusalem. And you got to remember that in Jerusalem, the significance of the temple, right? The temple of Jerusalem, the, back in those days, that was the only place where, where, Jesus, where, where God dwelt. Uh, it was that place where people all over the the, the uh the area came to Jerusalem to go into the temple and offer up their sacrifice. And so the, the huge significance that there was at one point where the, the Ark of the Covenant dwelt, uh, which for them was a, the, the real presence of, of God in that temple, in that place. And so they're walking away from that significant uh, place. It's their livelihood, it's their faith. That's what they, they, they live by. So they're walking away from from that satin, disappointed, and they're going home. They're going home to do what they know what to do, and disappointed and sad. Um, and then this line that as they're walking away, then Jesus himself drew near and walked with them. Right? This idea that uh, even as they're walking away, as they're satin, as they're uh, kind of the cloud of darkness over them because of what had happened. Uh, our Lord walked with them patiently, asking them questions, right? Like trying to like enter into that dialogue with them. Uh, first, he asked, like, uh, "What are you gonna? What are you discussing as you walk along?" And then, don't you know what happened? What happened? Jesus asked, right? As if he didn't know, as if somehow he was ignorant of what had happened to himself. But this idea of Jesus walking with them, asking them questions, like longing to enter into contact, into dialogue, into a real communion with them and, and see what happened to you. Where are you? Where's that sadness coming from? What happened? Uh, it is that same path that is meant to, that Jesus wants to have with us as we walk along our, our faith journey. And the real... The real surprise here should be to us that remember the words of Scripture are never random, and and Jesus very, very patiently asked them what they know about this Jesus the Nazarene, and they move on to say, and it's and it's critical that we we pick up on this, and said he was a prophet, prophet. he was a prophet, he was a. He was a good man, he was this, he was that. But these two who clearly were in a fraternal relationship with him in life, or at least knew of him or were near him before the crucifixion, are still in a bit of darkness. They do not know who Jesus is. They don't know. They're, they're calling him a prophet, they're calling him, and then he says, we hoped, we hoped that he was the one. But clearly now we're dejected, we're walking away. He wasn't the one, we're walking away. And it doesn't matter whether they're going to Emmaus or wherever they're going, they're still walking away, feeling as if their hopes were dashed. But they, their hopes were dashed in a figure that they still were not fully clear who he was. He was a prophet, he was a this, he was a that. And we even have it in our own day, where there is confusion as to who Jesus is. That he was a good man, a prophet, maybe a holy man, maybe this, maybe that. But still hanging on to that, to that horizontal bonding, that, that sense of, of you and me on equal footing. And never quite making that turn toward placing Jesus in a transcendent 
uh, relationship with with God. Absolutely. And a couple words to pay attention as, as we go through the gospel is that his disciples look downcast as they're walking away. This idea that they're, they're just simply looking down. That, that there was, it was such the sadness that they were living because they were holding to the, the image of, or the idea of Jesus that they had. This idea that he was a Messiah. Remember at Palm Sunday, everyone accepted him as a Messiah. People thought he was going to come and redeem Israel from the political oppression. But they failed to see that what Jesus' redemption was spiritual, right? That slavery from sin into uh, the freedom of, of the sons of God. Yeah. Remember also that Scripture uses the aspect of people's gaze in a way to, to speak of their orientation. And to have a downcast eye in Holy Scripture is to be earthbound is to be looking at the ground, to be looking at, at earth. And yeah, there is that sense of hopelessness and dejection, but a downcast eye, scripturally, is one that's focused on earth, focused on, on this reality, versus an upcast eye is one that has a heavenly perspective and, and all that comes with that. And so that's not random either that they have downcast or earthly uh, directed vision. And that's quite beautiful because yesterday we talked about Mary Magdalene going through this transition, this process of, of letting go of her old idea of who Jesus was into embracing the new reality of the risen Lord. And today we're seeing that precisely like this same process in the two disciples, where the two disciples are holding to their idea of the old Jesus like looking just very like downcast, looking into the earth, the, the earthly reality, that they're failing to see the risen reality, the, the the glorious reality of who Jesus is, like in its fullness now, as a divine person, not just a mere human being. Uh, and so we'll, we're seeing that this process, right? And as they they go by, then Jesus uses that opportunity as he's walking with them to break open the scriptures. And then he begins with the prophets and starts to explain the scriptures to them. Don't you know that, that Moses talked about the Messiah? Then Moses or the rest of the, what, what did he say? Um, right, he, if I find it, oh, it says, um, for, oh, first of all, he called him foolish. How foolish you are. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I remember a story that uh, <clears throat> going into school as I came to the States, um, I didn't know English, and so I was like, uh, as a way to say hi to one another, was like, "Hey, fool, how you doing?" And like, I didn't even know that, and but that's how we kind of grew up. And then uh, with the friends that I had, I remember one day I went to my nephew. He was, I don't know how old he was, six, seven, uh, eight, and, and so I was, I was talking to him. And as a way for me to say hi to him, I told him, I "Was like, hey, fool, how you doing?" I was like, "What?" Why did you call me? Like, no, I'm not a fool. You're a fool. <laughs> and so it was just funny to see that uh, something that for my generation growing up and uh, my, my classmates, it was just funny and it was a way to say hi. But for them, it was kind of offensive. And it doesn't have anything to do <laughs> with the gospel. But this idea that Jesus says, you foolish man, hey, don't you get it? Um, I'm not the one that you think I am. Like, I'm not just a mere human being. Like, I'm way more than that. I'm divine. I was in the flesh, but now I'm in, in the flesh, but in its fullness, in the resurrected body. And so, he goes on to, to talk about the scriptures, right? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them uh, what referred to him in all of the scriptures. And so he begins to go back to the Old Testament and to talk about the, the, the prophets, Moses. Everything he did, everything he said uh, was reflecting, was pointing towards Jesus. And so there's a great spiritual lesson right there for all of us, right? That in order for us to recognize the divinity of Jesus, it's important for us to know our story, to know our um, the Word of God. And the other day I was thinking that, yeah, we might not be able to receive our Lord sacramentally in the Eucharist, which we'll get in this gospel, but 
we're able to encounter the Lord in his, in his living word every time we read it, every time we open it. Like our Lord will give us some, will feed us through his word. And that's precisely what Jesus is doing. With uh, And you're also helping to answer your first question that you asked all of us. Where is it possible to have an encounter with the risen Christ? And we see it right there that that there is an encounter through Holy Scripture. Um, our own great Saint Jerome of antiquity was the first to say that ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. And he said that not to just be a jerk, but to tell us that it was that that is that is true that in order to fully embrace and understand our Lord Jesus Christ as the one risen from the dead, the source of all of our salvation, one must be extremely steeped in Holy Scripture. There are any number of, of folks that we know in our own lives who have walked away from, from Holy Mother Church, walked away from Christianity, not because they had a fully mature and, and, and deep understanding of the faith and scripture, but precisely because they were enticed away by, by, um, by, some, by some other um, low-hanging fruit that seemed, that seemed more, uh, more attainable. And, and I, um, I truly believe that if we're going to hang on to the faithful, and if we're going to stop this, um, this hemorrhage of, of people out of the church, that one of the ways that we're going to do that is to reclaim uh, our knowledge of Scripture and realize that Holy Scripture, the Bible itself, is a Catholic book, and that we must know our story, as you say. And as you were talking about this, this bleeding out of people walking away from, from the church, from God Himself, uh, the people claim that I can be spiritual but not religious, uh, like as if somehow we could separate both. And you can't really. Uh, yeah, that would be a great topic for another day, yeah. to where we talk about some of the some of the, um, the pseudo-logic of, of, uh, of being a church of one. Um, you know, I, and let's hold that yeah. for another day. But where I wanted to get at is that uh, people are walking away from our Lord or from the, His church because they're not encountering the risen Lord. It's like, there, there's, and I include myself, right? Uh, that at times, it, it's easy to walk away. It's, it's easy to look downcast. It's easy to just kind of like be kind of pulled by the stream of, of society, by the stream of the world, and kind of forget that our Lord has defeated death, that our Lord is real, that our Lord is with me, that at times in the moments of sadness, in the moments of, of problems, of issues, like our Lord does not abandon us. But it's easy to forget that in the midst of the struggle, He is walking with us, hoping to break open the scriptures for us, from hoping to break open our hearts so that he can come and dwell and help and point us heavenward. Well, the, yes, and it begs the question, how is it that all of these people, from Mary Magdalene to the two on the road to Emmaus, are seemingly so obtuse, so, so dull to, to what's going on? Well, there's probably some divine brilliance, some divine wisdom in that, in that imagine that all of these souls who are unsure not only of, of who this Jesus was that they walked with for some period of time, but are still struggling with, with all that has happened and trying to re-find him in his risen state and redefine who he is for, for themselves. If somehow our Lord would have compelled or pushed or um, in any other way caused the, the enlightenment of these souls except by their own revelation, by their own opening of their own eyes, then later on it could have, the case could have been made that this is all just, just 
the compulsion of a cult, that, that somehow there's a mass hysteria, that, that that's all this is. And there are those today who, who try to downplay Christianity by saying it was simply just mass hysteria, when in reality this clearly shows that our Lord allowed them to, to be in darkness and confusion until they were ready and able to see the truth individually and, and through their own eyes. Then there's absolutely no chance for deception, no chance for some sort of, of cult delusion, because these folks came to the decision, made the decision about who Jesus Christ is in their life through their own coming to faith. And that is true brilliance, because that is just as true then as it is today. Another way to look at that is, is the sense of is, there, <clears throat> is the sense of revelation in their own hearts. So they're they're together before the the crucifixion. And then here um, after the crucifixion, they're they're all separated. You know, one's at the tomb, these two are leaving town. Um, individually, it's very hard to be with the Lord. You gotta turn around and come back and recognize the Lord in their midst. And I think that's the wisdom of the road to a mass. Our RCI program is patterned after that. RCI isn't just a matter of dumping the knowledge in, but the discovery, you know, and I think that's what Jesus is in a way doing here. You know, what things are you talking about? Well, this and this, and we had hoped, well, here, let me connect the dots for you. This is where they're at, and the Lord is connecting at that point and going with them. So I really believe that the challenge is, are, are we on the road with Jesus or not? And, and which way are we going? Are we open to hearing them, and are we allowing that revelation uh, to happen to draw us back into the larger community, into the larger presence of God. The other part that goes with this, can you find Emmaus? If you go to the Holy Land, they're not quite exactly sure which town was Emmaus. Um, if you get in the cab, they'll take you to one of three places. Because um, they, they just, you know, it isn't that the place is important, it's the direction and the journey that, that, that's what it, that's what important. The, the journey is that the Lord, that we're journeying with the Lord, walking with Him, and that we are headed, um, not just to Jerusalem, the, the temple, but headed to the relationship in a deeper and a wider way with God. Absolutely. The other point that's very interesting there toward the end is that they say, and Jesus appeared that he was going on further. And then the disciples ask him to stay and eat with them. Again, that's brilliant. Because he could have said, well, here, let me... Let, let me stay with you, let me... They are the ones that had to choose to invite him to stay with them, to continue the relationship, to continue the meal. Jesus appeared that he was going on further. They were the ones that had to turn and invite him. Again, the brilliance of a subtle detail that shows that it is not only choice, but it is also not Jesus forcing himself or his presence on anyone that we choose. He he doesn't he doesn't as as the perfect um, as the perfect lover that he is. He never forces himself. He always simply invites and allows us to say yes or no to that to that invitation. And, and the beauty of that at at their invitation, our Lord came in and he celebrated the Eucharist with broke the bread, and took the bread, blessed, broke it, and gave it to them. In those words of the, the Eucharist, of, of consecration, consecration um, that right at that moment, their, their, their blindness is kind of done, and they're able to see. And the moment they see the reality of who is it that was with them, our Lord disappeared. And there's a spiritual nugget right there, right? That our Lord disappears in, in his physicality so that we like uh, Mary don't want to like hold him to the physical reality of Jesus but then he disappears and it stays in the bread right this idea that Jesus disappears in, in his in his uh, physicality but remains in the Eucharist and that through that as they're eating that they realize that their hearts were burning uh, with Holy Scripture yeah. yeah. 
Like that idea that as they were going through it, they didn't realize they must have. There's something about pondering and reflecting here. Um, that you're able to know the mystery of God's fire in your heart. That you're able to come to like fully know of it. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> well, the, the, the pondering. The, the clear pondering and the clear moment, this is a moment of transition. That our Lord was there physically with them. He broke the bread, and as soon as their eyes were open and they saw Him, they saw Him in the breaking of the bread, then all of a sudden their worldview, if you will, as we talked about yesterday, was immediately broadened. And all of a sudden, they went from a very myopic or narrow, earthly, horizontal view of me here and you there. The breaking of the bread then becomes a much more uh, wide-opening, transcendent um, revelation now of of a Jesus that does not require his his bodily physical presence for the reality of his of his ongoing um, relationship with them. So again, just as Mary had had that moment of transition from from a more earthly horizontal to a more vertical transcendent, it happens here too. Boom, boom, and. He physically disappears. They recognized him in the breaking of the bread. But more importantly, upon doing that, what was their orientation? Did they keep on going toward wherever, toward Emmaus? No. They turned. They had a metanoia. They turned 180 degrees and headed back to Jerusalem, headed back to the center, to the source of faith. And, and through an encounter with the risen Christ, they completely changed the, the direction, the orientation of their life, and returned uh, to the font, returned to the source, heading back. Um, that is a, that's a conversion, a metanoia, uh, an encounter with the risen Christ, all bundled up into one, one brilliant story. And heading back for more, right? more of that burning, more of that fire in their soul, in their heart, of that wanting to be with the Lord, of wanting to spend time with Him, of wanting to continue to like just dwell in the Lord, with the Lord. Um, and probably still not having every question answered. And so many times, if we think that we must have every single pondering, every single question answered before we can move, then we're probably going to be stuck. And, and, and that's where I think that we fail at times too in our faith, that we think that before we can speak about it, we got to know everything. Uh, I certainly don't know everything. Um, I don't know how I passed through the seminary. <laughs> but like you don't have to know everything in order to talk openly about what the Lord is doing in your heart. Talk to your family, talk to your spouse, talk to the, your neighbor about that fire that you're sensing in your heart about the Lord, about His presence, about His Word, about uh, how you experience Him in the sacraments. Uh, so, our own Lord will give us, when the faith, when the fire of faith explodes in us, our Lord will give us whatever means that He wishes for us to witness that faith. And it may not always be in words. It may be a change in perspective, a change in um, in something as simple as the, uh, the language that we use or the way that we, that we choose to relate to others. Uh, any number of little, little changes that are evident to other people that say something has happened to you and, it, and I want to know what it is. That's, a, that is um, that's the fruit of an encounter with the living, risen Lord. Christ. So we're coming to the end. Uh, I know your heart is burning for more. My heart is burning for more. But we need to bring it down to the earth, right? Uh, 
we've noticed that in yesterday's gospel and today's gospel, we see clearly this process, this journey, that it begins by knowing Jesus in the earthly realm and then making that transition in the encounter with Jesus, the risen Lord, and then opening up their horizons so that they have room for that divinity of Jesus, that divinity that is unlimited in power, unlimited in glory, that when He comes upon you, it empowers you to do things like Peter did in the first reading today. Take a look at it. Read it. To do marvelous signs of faith for the building of His kingdom here on earth. And so this journey that the disciples, the apostles were on is the same journey that you and I are in. And that we are, we are asked to continue to grow in our humanity, in, in our humility, so that we acknowledge our, 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 our limited reality, our human poverty, because the moment we do that, it's not to diminish our humanity, but it is so that we might become empowered by Jesus' divinity and His coming to be with us, to enrich the poverty of our humanity, the power, the limited reality of our horizon. And so that's where the faith is. That's where the wealth, the spiritual wealth is in the encounter with the risen Lord. And we're not done. We'll continue with uh, this Easter time talking about this process. How do we encounter it? But remember, our Lord is in, the, in His Word, in His living Word. Let us dive into it. Let us ponder. Let us reflect. Let us read. Meditate. Uh, that should be done, right? Read. Meditate. Pray. Contemplate. We'll talk more about it later. Uh, join us for Mass if you like uh, in a little bit with our middle school uh, kids. So, 815. 815. Thank you again, 4 o'clock tonight for uh, the Divine Mercy Chaplet. And also, if you're interested, uh, parking lot adoration at the Grand Site tonight from 5 to 6 with confessions in the church. For sure. So, Amen. So, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As, As it was, was in the beginning, beginning is, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.